Hey everybody, welcome here. It's uh, going to be 10 a.m. in a little bit, and then we'll get our class started. Um, good morning to anybody who's watching, or if you're watching it later at a different time. Good day to you, good evening. Um, we, ha we have about five minutes, and then we'll jump right into our, our meeting for today. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, cool. I just sent out a little reminder to the members of our class, just in case anybody had trouble finding the link. But uh, but yeah, we got a few minutes until it's 10. Get comfortable, get situated. Um, just know that we have our like live chat over here. Anyone can say hi anytime. Chime in. It's always nice to hear from you guys. Say good morning. But um, usually the numbers jump up right close to class time, a minute or two before. So not to rush. <clears throat> Three more minutes. Oh yes, definitely. I'm all about my beverages. Um, that's a little Arnold Palmer, you know. I don't know if you like those, but I always mess with the mixture. That's actually, I believe, limeade with uh, with some black unsweetened iced tea. Yeah, gotta stay hydrated. So, yeah, same. <clears throat> cool. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're having a good start to the day. <clears throat> Welcome, welcome everyone. A few minutes and then when 10 a.m. arrives, we will, we will launch into our, uh, our first lecture meeting. <clears throat> Right, just about another minute to go. Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> All 
All right. Nice to see you guys arriving to the meeting. Just taking the full time to give everyone a chance to to arrive, and then we'll really uh, got about thirty seconds. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so it's pretty much 10 a.m. at this point. So uh, I'll just say, hey, everybody, welcome to class. Good to see you guys this morning. Good morning um, to all who are, you know, here for now. Just go ahead and feel free if you want to say hello over in the chat. That'll also get you. Uh, with the format or anything, so you, know, you just type whatever over into the chat bar and I'll see it. Hi, hi there, Ivan. Um, yes, hello, everybody. Good to see you guys. Parker, hello. Um, Michael, good to see you too. Yes, yes, good to see everybody. All right, awesome. Well, um, thanks again for being here. Hope you guys are having a good uh, first week of class. Hope everything's been going smooth with all your other courses and stuff. Um, so just know that at different times throughout the lecture, you may want to ask questions or offer comments or anything else. So when and if you want to do that, please just chat and uh, type the message in and I'll see it in real time and that's how I'll be able to interact and uh, get all of your guys' <clears throat> questions answered in real time. But to everybody saying hello, it's great to see you guys, really appreciate your attendance this morning and um, awesome. Okay, so. Let's go ahead and get our class started. Um, this is how we're going to do a lot of these meetings through YouTube Live. So unless otherwise noted, you know the class time that you will arrive at 10 a.m. You should just be tuning tuned into this YouTube channel, and um, and you'll get your lecture through this through this platform. Um, when I want to go back to Zoom for specific uh, select meetings, I'll let you guys know and send the link for any any Zoom meetings. Office hours will be through Zoom and uh, maybe there'll be a couple of other time review sessions perhaps and stuff like that. All right guys, so awesome. Uh, let's jump right into it then. This is Philosophy 101, Intro to Philosophy. The first thing I thought that I might do is talk to you guys just about the word philosophy itself and try and reveal to you the meaning of it if you go back and you break down its, its origins and root uh, and etymology. So here's this word, philosophy. Notice that I'll use the whiteboard a lot of times, just kind of in the traditional way, um, writing some written notes on it. Is this a piece of trivia that any of you guys uh, know about by chance? Any student in this class know what the word philosophy means if you go back and examine its root origins? Nobody? It's okay if you don't. Let me know if there's anybody who has a even half-hearted guess about what philosophy could possibly mean. but. I suppose, ah, good, Davey, exactly, that, that's, that's quite close, yes, um, wisdom, I see, okay, good, love of wisdom, that's true, so let me give you some further detail on that, so it breaks down into two original terms that have been kind of combined together from Greek, so uh, first of all, the word philo comes from the root philia, which is a Greek word that just means to love, when you um, hear English words like audiophile, bibliophile, uh, those employ the root philia. Like, so audiophile is a lover of sounds. A bibliophile is a lover of books and reading. So file is to denote lover of. And sophia is the root of the second part of the word. Nowadays, a lot of times, sophia is just a nice feminine name. But um, in its original Greek meaning, it refers to the concept of wisdom. Okay, so philosophy then, in other words, is the love of wisdom. And a philosopher would be considered a lover of wisdom. That's, I think, interesting. Um, because if you really then think about the concept of philosophy, deeply rooted in the concept itself is this passionate pursuit of wisdom 
through the attitude of love. A lot of other academic disciplines um, employ the term logos as part of their original meaning, which means the logic of something, like biology, the logos of life, bio meaning life. Um, but in philosophy anyway, given that philia is a part of the word, there's definitely some type of um, some desire and passion toward the pursuit of wisdom. So philosophy is an ancient discipline going back thousands of years. And uh, it, since it's the love of wisdom, it involves deep investigation and reflection on questions of interest to the human condition. You know, what are my moral obligations? What's the nature of reality? Um, you know, and for example, does God exist? So we're going to start this journey through philosophy by examining one of the main topics that is of interest, and that's the philosophy of religion. So philosophy can take as its subject matter any number of different topics. You know, what is time? What is space? What are objects? What are properties? Um, but the first subject that I wanted us to look at in this class, and it's also the first one in our textbook, is the philosophy of religion. So let's go ahead and now start talking about that topic. <clears throat> so philosophy of religion, that's our first starting uh, subject of, of study in this class. In the philosophy of religion, we basically want to try and examine the content of religious belief, um, the nature of God, um, and to consider the arguments that can be given on the behalf of God's existence, what criticisms can be made against those arguments, and to see where this, uh, what this tells us about our own understanding of ourselves and our relationship to the divine or lack thereof as it may be. Um, now, there are three main positions within the philosophy of religion and really just in everyday life about the question of God's existence. So there are these three major camps that people divide into when it comes to this issue of God and the existence of God. So I want to talk to you about those three categories right now. So <clears throat> so three positions on the existence of God. Okay, so one viewpoint, and this is probably the most widespread um, in terms of just the statistical uh, number of people who would identify in one of these categories, that's theism. We'll talk about it as the individual who practices that view or believes it, theist. So maybe the term theist is already some way familiar to you. Um, so let's just see if it's in your mind. What do you think is the term theist mean? What, who or what is a theist by definition? A person called a theist is what sort of individual, what defines the, the term theism? If one is a theist, what does that mean about that person? To be a theist, an individual would have to believe in God, right? So it's someone who believes in God, that's correct. A person who believes that God exists. Theist, a person who believes that God exists. So, um, defined in this sense, theism is not specific to any particular uh, variety of religion, but spans across all in any case where a person believes in a god of some kind. So theism is not specific to the idea of Christianity or Judaism or Islam. Um, a theist is a person who believes in God, so it would encompass and include members of all different religious uh, denominations and practice uh, as long as the person has a belief in God. So theism is quite widespread. I believe that just looking at the demographic breakdown in America, um, it's upwards of 80% of people that are a member of some religious um, 
denomination or other. Okay, so that's people who believe that God exists, that believe that the idea of God is not just something fictional or um, invented, but that it's really a real being. Okay, so theism, theist. That's not the only position, though. Of course, there's kind of the con. Now, what could be an atheist? I'm sure you can clearly tell me, and that's not too difficult, and everyone knows. An atheist is just, well, they're not, they're not theists. They are people who what? What's the definition of that concept? Yes, yeah, someone who does not believe in God, exactly. So a person who does not believe that God exists. So the atheist is not don't believe in this. Um, now, it's a minority um, of the global population that are self-identified atheists, but it actually, according to some reports that I've read, seems to be a growing um, share of people, even though it's still quite small. Um, the hold of, like, a, I don't know, religious orthodoxy over large parts of the world population seem to have decreased in its influence over the centuries. So atheism, although it's a small um, overall percentage of the general human race, there's still a substantial uh, minority, maybe 10% or less. So some people don't believe that God exists. Some people maybe think that um, there's not uh, very good arguments for God's existence, or maybe they think that there's actually some type of good evidence for the non-existence of God. But for whatever reason, yes, some people are in this other category. And then there's a third category that's often mentioned. Um, I'll erase up here just to create that space for it. But what I'm talking about in this third case is the idea of uh, so-called agnosticism or the agnostic. <clears throat> now, who or what is an agnostic? An agnostic is basically a sort of person who they're often thought of as like intermediate between these other two possible extremes. So I shouldn't say extremes, but between these other two options. So the agnostic is one that like says, I don't either affirm or deny the existence of God. So they take no position. They don't um, characterize themselves as believers or non-believers, just sort of the type of person that says, I have no stance on this. Um, I'm not for or against the claim that God exists. And why would one be an agnostic? Typically, the, the idea is like because they think there's not good enough evidence to prove one way or the other. Um, you ask Parker, the theist or atheist, does that apply to maybe not a god but like a higher power? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on what you do mean by the term higher power. Could a higher power just be like an uh, interdimensional like life form from another part of the multiverse that created this universe in like a laboratory? I mean... Um, maybe then you could say relative to the beings that populate this universe, that being would be like the higher power. But um, I do think that generally the concept of God is thought to be something ultimate and absolute. So it have to be like the ground of all being, not just something that emerges from other things, right? Um, I know that's a deep question and a deep answer, but I would have to answer it that way. To be a true theist, you would have to think not just that there is some naturalistic explanation for the cause of the universe, um, but that there's something divine. Okay, so but back to this agnostic, good question. Thank you very much. So what's an agnostic? It's a person who suspends judgment on this question. Why? Because they think there's less than enough evidence. So a person who suspends judgment, that means they don't judge affirmatively or negatively. They suspend judgment because of a perceived lack of evidence. Now, I've heard some make the argument that agnostic is not a bona fide third category. Some have said that, well, it's really just another type of atheism. It's just a person who doesn't want to sound as, as strident as the, as the atheist, rather characterizing themselves as lacking belief one way or the other. But some have argued, you know, well, if you don't have an affirmative belief that God exists, then you're still n not a believer, 
and therefore you could technically be designated as an atheist. So some people just believe there's only those two categories. You either believe in God or you just don't. But I think that <clears throat> breaking it down into three is somewhat ra rational, and, and since it's a common classification, then I just uh, put it here for you to think about. Okay, so now what we're looking at is a set of arguments that are given by people from any of these different perspectives. And we're going to sample those arguments. So we're going to try to learn what have been the best, most powerful arguments in history that theists have given for the existence of God. And what have been some of the criticisms and objections to those views. Um, by understanding and kind of mastering these arguments, you will, I think, gain a better detailed understanding of what the intellectual foundations are of uh, religious belief itself. Okay, so we're going to try and see, you know, what are those great arguments that have survived through the generations, which make an attempt to prove that God exists, to tell you that it's not merely a matter of faith, but something that you can rationally argue for. Okay, so let's see, we're starting with one of these main arguments for God's existence. There's going to be at least three big ones that we're going to study as we continue through the class. The first of these is what we call the ontological argument for God's existence. So today, the remaining part of today's lesson is all about just trying our best to get clear on the so-called ontological argument, which is an argument for God's existence, trying to prove that God exists. Okay, so I'll erase this panel and then we create more notes on this argument. <laughs> Okay, then. So first, let me tell you about the author of this particular um, argument. This is coming to us from a man whose name is Saint Anselm. <clears throat> okay, so Saint Anselm was a medieval um, church scholar and theologian way back in the um, 11th, century, 11th century. He lived from 1033 until 1109. And um, <clears throat> in the year 1077, he wrote this book. Um, within the book, he has this argument that we're going to start exam examining. So the book is called The Proslogion. And that book is from about 1077. Although the exact date of publication is not 100% clear, it's, it's thought to be sometime 1077 or 1078. So in that book, The Proslogion, Anselm provides what is called the ontological argument. The ontological argument. So this is the name of the argument now that we're going to try and break down and analyze, the ontological argument. Um, the word ontological comes from the Greek root ontos, having to do with being. So it's an argument, in other words, that tries to prove God exists just by thinking about what kind of being God is assumed to be. So it's trying to just establish that he exists based on the definition or the concept of God, right? Um, about St. Anselm, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury, so he was actually um, a well-known scholar and a church figure. Um, later on, after his death, he was canonized in the Christian church as a saint, um, so that's why he has this title of St. Anselm. So he's actually quite an important historical figure in the Christian church's history. Of course, this is prior to the... Um, the, the Protestant Reformation, so there was no schism in the church yet uh, between Protestantism and Catholicism. So although today the concept of a saint would be more relegated to the Catholic denomination of Christianity, this was prior to that division, so it would just be in the Christian church. Okay, so the ontological argument from St. Anselm, which we find in his book, The Proslogion, from 1077. Now we're going to go into the argument itself and all those little details. <laughs> Okay, then. So, um, to start off this, this uh, piece of writing, 
the author Anselm asks the reader, any of us who are reading this, to um, consider this question, what kind of being is God believed to be? You know, so when you think about the, the concept or the idea of God, what are some of the essential features or attributes that come to mind when you think of defining the idea of God? All right. So what we're going to try and do for a moment, just a little exercise with you guys here, is think of what are some qualities or attributes that are often associated with the concept of God. Okay, so let's see what you can put out there. Okay, Gary, good all, already, um, and Davey as well. Omnipotent, all-knowing, all good. Very, very good. That's already hitting three of the big four. Um, so let me write those up here. Omnipotent is one of them. So that's a word probably known to some of us, but maybe not. Omnipotent mean? means being all-powerful, having unlimited infinite power, so all-powerful. When you consider the etymology of this word, potent, refers to power, potency. Omni means all. So being which is omnipotent is all-powerful. Just a quick word about all-powerful. So God, when one considers the being God, they're thinking of some being that has power, but not just some power or even just a lot of power, but infinite power. Power to do anything whatsoever just simply through his will. So God's power is thought to be absolute and unlimited that there's nothing that goes beyond the capacity or ability of God, that he could achieve or do anything whatsoever because of, of his divinity and his um, ultimate absolute power. Okay, so omnipotent is one of them. I see there also, Gary, as you write, all-knowing and all-good. Does anybody know the term, uh, uh, the fancy sort of technical term for all-knowing? If so, put it in the chat. If not... You're going to learn in just a minute anyway. But, yes, another one of these big qualities is all-knowing. And just to let you guys know, the word for that is omniscient. Okay. Omniscient, all-knowing. Um, so <clears throat> the word omniscient also has its own origins. From Latin, scientia means knowledge, and that's actually where our word science derives from. So having all knowledge, omniscient, that's all-knowing. And yeah, so God is thought of as having perfect knowledge, ultimate, absolute knowledge of everything, that God um, is fully informed about everything. So everything in the past, present, and future is completely known to God. Nothing could take him by surprise. Nothing could be unknown to God or not understood by God. Okay, so omniscient, another one. Then there's, uh, I see, all good. There's a word that corresponds to that definition as well, and that is omnibenevolent. So that's all good. So God is considered as a being that is ultimately powerful, all-knowing, but also all-good. So if it was just a being that was abs had absolute power and knowledge, but that they were evil or malicious, then you couldn't count on them to be a force um, that's righteous and, and, and good in this universe. But God is thought of as not being just neutral or negative on a moral scale, but being good, righteous, and pure. So God's goodness is thought to be perfect and absolute and infinite. So he's good to the maximum extent. He's not just somewhat good, but then he has his little moral flaws also, like all of us. Rather, God is thought to be utterly perfect. And so his goodness is perfect, too, and infinite. And there's one more that I actually haven't seen anyone mention. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to take a crack at one more. But, yeah, there you go, Jess. Omnipresent. That's the fourth major quality that's typically presumed to have to do with God, so omnipresent. And as you might guess just by the word now, omnipresent simply means being present everywhere all the time, so all present. A 
Okay, so God being omnipresent would mean that he's, um, he's all throughout everything in time and space, so that there's no place or time where God is not present. That's obviously different from finite beings like us. Like right now, you're present at the place wherever you are, where you're watching this video, um, but you're not present, let's say, 100 miles away from that place. Uh, but the thought of God is that God is everywhere all the time. So he's here, there, and everywhere. And then also in terms of time, God is thought of as existing at all times, not just for the moment and not just for some stretch of time like us, but rather all throughout the past, present, and future. So God's presence is thought of as extending everywhere throughout the whole universe, throughout everything in space and time. So when you consider these four qualities and you kind of summarize them up to what they all add up to, what Anselm would argue is that they basically amount to the idea that God is thought of as the greatest conceivable being, okay? So that's his, like, summary of the various qualities that we just are discussing here. And that's what he says. God is thought of in the mind as the greatest conceivable being, okay? So I'll erase this, and then we add some more notes. So if a being is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, and all-present, then, in other words, that is just that the greatest conceivable being. So the conclusion of this little review of what God is thought of to be leads us to this outcome, that God is generally considered a, as the greatest conceivable being. What that means is that God is thought to be the being that's the greatest being you could ever think of or conceive of, that there's no being that could ever be thought of that is greater than God. So God would be the greatest thing that you could ever think of in your mind. Now, I like to say it this way, the greatest conceivable being, because I think it's a little less confusing to read and to say, but just so that you're clear, when you read the text, he sometimes uses a somewhat awkward way of saying that. He will sometimes phrase it as such, that the greatest conceivable being, that, that God is, in other words, the being than which none greater can be conceived. So when you encounter in the textbook, you know, awkward sentences like this, I just want you to understand that all he is saying when he writes that way is this, that God is the greatest conceivable being. This is the same idea stated in different words. It's just to state it as a comparative, that God is the being than which none greater can be conceived. So in comparison to God, no other being can be conceived of that's greater than him. So I think it scans and reads a little more straightforwardly to simply say greatest conceivable being. But I just wanted to make that clear to you because I know sometimes a student reads it and is like, the being then what, greater what? Like, I can't understand what that means. But now you hopefully do. Okay, so let me read a little bit from the actual text here. And you'll see how this author, how this man put it back then in 1077. Okay, so he opens it up on page 15 of our book. And at the first paragraph or so, he's, he's addressing himself, he's directing his uh, words to God. So he says it this way, um, well then, Lord, you who give understanding to faith, grant me that I may understand as much as you see fit that you exist as we believe you to exist, and that you are what we believe you to be. Now, we believe that you are something than which nothing greater can be thought. Or can it be that a thing of such a nature does not exist since, and now he's quoting from the scriptures, from Psalms, he says, since, quote, the fool has said in his heart there is no God, unquote. But surely when this same fool hears that what I am speaking about, namely something than which nothing greater can be thought, he understands what he hears. And what he understands is in his mind, even if he does not understand that it actually exists. Okay, so let me back up and give you some more context and discussion here. Um, 
he opens up by saying the idea of God is the idea of the greatest conceivable being. But is it possible that this being doesn't exist because the fool has said in his heart there is no God? But even the fool, he says, understands this idea because the idea is in his mind. Now, in other words, what do you think he's saying there? He's saying that who has this idea of God in their mind? Let me pose it to you as a question. Who is Anselm claiming are the type of people that has this idea of the definition of God in their mind, the idea that he's the greatest conceivable being? Who has got that concept of God according to Anselm? Let's see if you can give me that information. So as he's arguing, who, who has this idea of God as the greatest conceivable being? What do you think? We've talked about different types of people so far in this class. Maybe that could help you think about this. But what would be the, uh, the category of people who have the idea of God in their mind? What do you think he says there? Theists, okay, good. I like that, Davy. That's true. Certainly theists understand the idea of God as the greatest conceivable being. But here's a little uh, perhaps surprising or um, interesting additional thing that he says there. He says actually that it's not only theists who have this idea of God, the definition of God as the greatest conceivable being. He says actually even who else has that idea at least of the definition of God? Like, who also can comprehend the idea that God is thought of as the greatest conceivable being? Theists, for sure, but also atheists, too. So what he says is, even if you're the so-called fool who believes there's no God, the fool who says in their heart there's no God, even if you're an atheist or an agnostic or some other approach to, to the question of theism, he says, still, though, you have the idea of God in the mind, the idea of the greatest conceivable being. So the definition of God, he says, is actually universal to everybody. The difference between theists and atheists, as he sees it, is not in the terms of what they define God to be or what they think the word refers to. The difference between a theist and an atheist is, well, what is it? We've already talked about it. The theist believes that being really exists, and the atheist doesn't think that the being really exists. But where they can sort of shake hands and agree, the theist and the atheist, is at least the definition of the word, right? That's what he's trying to set out at the beginning here. That's why he says, even if you are the fool who says in his heart there's no God, you still understand the idea because the idea is in your mind, okay? So let me repeat. He opens his discussion by saying, what is God believed to be? Answer, after some thought, the greatest conceivable being. Next, who has that idea of God in their mind? And according to his, uh, you know, analysis, everybody. You don't have to be a theist to understand what the word God at least means in terms of definition of a word. So he says everyone then, theist and atheist alike, have a common conception of the concept of God as the greatest conceivable being. Okay, so to take his argument to the next stage now, he asks a new question, or he makes a new point. He makes the point that there are some things, right, that only exist in the mind. But on the other hand, there are things that exist in both the mind and also in reality, too. Okay, so I want to put that info here on this little board. And you guys will help me come up with some good examples of both types, types of things. Okay. All right, so... I'm just going to draw this little diagram, and up here to the top left, I'm going to put in the info, uh, the header, exists um, only in the mind. And on the top right, that's going to be labeled, exists in both the mind and in reality. Okay, so exists only in the mind versus exists in both the mind and in reality. Let's start over here on the left. Um, 
help me now and see if we can come up with some like examples of things that exist only in the mind. So I'm talking about stuff that is not actually real in outside reality. It's only something that is like um, in fiction or imagination. So something that does not exist outside of the mind. Michael, you give the case of dreams and I see what you mean by the case of dreams, but I would only, uh, I would only have this point to say as perhaps a counter to that, which is that when you have a dream, you sometimes have dreams of things that do really exist too though, right? Like I can have a dream of me being at Chapman teaching a lecture. Um, you know, I've had dreams or I don't know, nightmares like that before. Um, but Chapman really does actually exist too. So I, of course some dreams may be of weird and fantastical things that don't really exist, but without being more specific, I think uh, I, I wouldn't want to put it up there to confuse us, but, but I see what you meant. Um, Bigfoot. Now that's a very good example, right? Yeah. So like the Bigfoot Sasquatch or whatever, that's just a made up creature of lore. You know, there's no real thing like that. Uh, so that's a good one. Let's see more stuff in that same genre. You know, so like fictional beings, not real things, just only in the mind. What else could it be? A couple more, you know. So you, you see Bigfoot, you see that that's like the right kind of example. What could be another case? A thing that's only in the mind. Santa, okay, fair enough. Dragons, that's all good. Dragons, the big mythical flying lizard-like creature that breathe fire in some cases. Those are not real, but of course they're in fantasy and fiction. Santa Claus, okay, that's fair. Even though there was, I guess, somebody named St. Nicholas that made gifts at one point in history, but the mythical Santa that we all heard of, the, the gift giver on Christmas with the sleigh, yeah. Pokemon, that very good, yeah, vampires. Great examples. Okay, so I, we could go on and on. You know, This could go on forever, but basically I just wanted to give you guys a little random sampling of some things that are just only in the mind. They're just fictional. They're not real. Okay. But now over here, let's put in some stuff on this side. And this is going to be, I hope, easy to fill in because those are things that exist in the mind, but also they're, they're real too. Like, so they're not just made up by your mind. Even if nobody thought about them at all, they'd be out there in reality. So what are some well-known, objectively real things that are not like any of these? Uh, and it could just be any ordinary thing. Just, I mean, look around you and come up with examples of whatever. So what's something... Uh, or things that exist in the mind and in reality. Okay, dogs. Good example. Dogs, houses, yeah. Um, let's see, what else is there? Gravity, a little abstract. Of course, gravity does exist, but it's a force rather than an object in a sense. So I'd rather have something a little more straightforward for some people. Cars, sure. Um, then let me give you like some particular things because these are all categories, you know, dogs, houses, cars. You're not giving me a specific house, but like, for example, the White House um, or, you know, the moon or the Eiffel Tower. Like the moon, for example, it's not just something made up in your head. Like, and if you stop thinking about it, there's no reality to it. Of course, it's out there. It's objectively real. Same as these other things listed here. Student debt. That's kind of funny. Yeah. Is money and finance is a real thing? I mean, in a weird way, it's kind of an abstraction, but but that's okay. The sun, another good one. Fears, Samuel, tough one. I mean, again, that gets us into a gray area case that's less like black and white than the ones that we have up here. But uh, you know, when you have a fear, you're experiencing like a um, an emotional state that's brought about according to the scientific description by states of the brain. So it could be that the feeling of fear corresponds to an objectively real process in the neurons and synapses of your brain. But, um, but anyway, that's, that's a little bit more of a confusing description to get it on the table here than some of these. But at any rate, okay, so now look, some things exist only in the mind, things like this. Some things exist in both the mind and reality, things like this. Now here's the question Anselm has got. Which kind of thing between those two is God? Is God like, you know, just something made up like the dragon or Pokemon or whatever? Uh, or is God something that is objectively real? That's not just in your head, not just in your imagination. 
but it exists outside of the mind and is objectively real. In other words, it exists in reality. And here's what he says. He says, actually, God has to be in this category, both the mind and in reality. He has to be. Why? Because think of the definition of God that we've provided and that we've already discussed. The definition of God, he believes, which is universal to all, is greatest conceivable being. But what's greater, to exist only in the mind or to exist in both the mind and in reality? And as he argues, it's greater to exist in both because that's just more existence. To exist in the mind is one thing, and I guess that's a little great. But if that same thing that exists only in the mind existed in reality too, that would be even greater. So in order for God to satisfy the definition, which has already, he believes, been agreed to, that he's thought of as the greatest conceivable being, then God must exist in both the mind and in reality. Because again, if he did not exist in both, then on that basis alone, he would fail to be the greatest conceivable being. So example of a, thinking of a painting first, but they haven't painted it yet. Stephen, you say that sounds like a paradox, perhaps. We will get to the criticisms. There's plenty of people who find fault with the reasoning here. Um, but let's just get it on the table first, then we'll try and see what others say in terms of trying to tear it down or, or to debunk it, right? But um, he says, if you imagine a painter who had a thought of a painting, and they've not at, at all painted it yet, at that point in time, this painting exists only in their mind. It's a scene and a... Uh, a visual image that's never been created, so it's merely an imaginary thing. But then when they go forth and they paint that same idea and they create the painting, now it exists not just in their mind, but in reality outside of their mind. And he says that is greater than in the case where it only exists in the mind. So if things are greater when they exist in both the mind and in reality, and if God's definition is greatest conceivable being, then he must therefore be in this category because otherwise, what's the problem? He wouldn't be the greatest conceivable being. And then we would be contradicting the definition. So let me read then what he says about that and you'll be able to hopefully connect his own words with the analysis provided here. So he says, um, surely when the fool hears what I am speaking about, something than which nothing greater can be thought, he understands what he hears. And what he understands is in his mind, even if he does not understand that it actually exists. Because it is one thing for an object to exist in the mind, and another thing to understand that an object actually exists. Thus, when a painter plans beforehand what he is going to execute, he has the picture in his mind, but he does not yet think that it actually exists because he has not yet painted it. However, when he has actually painted it, then he both has it in his mind, and understands that it exists because he now, has, now he has made it. Even the fool then, and he keeps using the term fool as his generic label for atheist, which is, I don't know, it's kind of rhetorical, but he says, even the fool then is forced to agree that something then which nothing greater can be thought exists in the mind, since he understands this when he hears it. So he returns to the point that everyone's got the idea of God in their mind at least. So at a minimum, God is like on this side of the ledger, but... Whatever is understood is in the mind, and surely that then which a greater cannot be thought cannot exist in the mind alone, because if it existed only in the mind, it could be thought to exist in reality also, which is greater. If then that then which a greater cannot be thought exists in the mind alone, this same that then which a greater cannot be thought is that then which a greater can be thought, but that is obviously impossible. Therefore, there is absolutely no doubt that something then which a greater cannot be thought exists both in the mind and in reality. All right. So that is the essential argument right there. Um, and he rests his case with that. He says, look, the idea of God is the idea of the greatest conceivable being. That's an idea that all people hold, even atheists, who may say they don't believe it's a real thing, but they understand the concept and the definition. So from there, he says, well, OK, you could either exist in just the mind or in the mind and in reality. But things that only exist in the mind are not as great as these things are. So since God's definition says greatest conceivable, you would, be conf you would be contradicting the definition if you said the greatest conceivable being only exists in the mind. Because things that only exist in the mind are on that account not as great as they could be. So the definition alone is what he is saying is leading us to this conclusion of his that there must be this God not just in your mind but also in reality. 
Why, again? I'm telling you, because it's greater to exist in both. And being defined as greatest, he can't lack for greatness. So he has to exist in both. See what he did there? He's trying to get to the conclusion that God exists, armed with the definition of God, and a second claim that it's greater to really exist in reality and mind, rather than only mind. Okay? Now, if he had just kind of ended his argument with that, I feel like in a way it might have even been stronger uh, than what it ultimately is, because he continues from there to add a second claim that goes over and beyond just trying to prove God exists. And maybe in some minds it might seem like this puts him on shakier ground, but let's talk about his next point. In the next paragraph on the following page, he continues by saying this, that not only does he think he has now proven God exists, but he believes that he can also prove alongside that, that God cannot even be thought not to exist. That's a little tongue twister, so I'm going to write it here on the board. <clears throat> Okay, so the second point that he makes in the course of this little essay is that God cannot be thought to not exist. So it's, it's a little bit of a confusing phrasing, I know, because it's a double negative. He can't be thought to not exist. In other words, the thought of God not existing is impossible to even have in your mind. So not only does he have to actually exist in reality to live up to this definition, greatest conceivable being, but furthermore, he cannot even be thought of as not existing. And why does he add this to his argument? Well, he uses the same type of logic and reasoning as he employed to try and prove that God exists. Here's what he says. Since God is defined as the greatest conceivable being, he, he has to be as perfect as anything can be. And if a being can be thought of as not existing, if you're able to think of a being not existing, then that being is not as great as a being that cannot be thought of as not existing. Let me try and explain that again. Any other being aside from God can be thought of as not existing. Like take, for example, the um, Chapman University over there. It exists. Um, it's a building and it's a set of buildings on the campus that physically exist. But we can all imagine a possible situation where, I don't know, like an asteroid crashes into it or something and just demolishes it and then it wouldn't exist. Um, so the idea that other things can fail to exist or cease to exist is easy to form. Even me and you, as sad as it may be, we can imagine situations in which we never had existed or don't exist any longer. But God, he says, the idea of God is too great for that idea to exist. There's no way for you to think of God as non-existent. If that was possible, then that would deprive God of some of the greatness that's bound up with his definition. So in order for God to really be the greatest being conceivable, he cannot be thought to not exist. Okay? Now let me read his words on that. But hopefully you follow me, right? His claim there is that being the greatest conceivable being rules out the possibility that you could even be thought of as not existing. So in a way, he extends his argument a stage further. He goes beyond just saying that he must exist in order to be this greatest conceivable being and adds to that that he cannot even be thought of as not existing. You say, doesn't that almost prove he doesn't exist? I don't see how. I mean, he's explicitly saying that he's proving the total opposite, that the definition of God is soul sufficient to prove that he's real, because you have an idea of the greatest being in your mind. And what does it mean to be the greatest being? It means that you, first of all, well, have to have many qualities, but also among them is to exist. Lacking existence is to lack in utter absolute greatness. So I'll read the second part here. He says, and certainly this being so truly exists that it cannot be even thought not to exist. Because something can be thought to exist that cannot be thought not to exist. And this is greater than that which can be thought not to exist. Hence, and I know it's a little confusing wording, but I'm trying to break it down and bring it down to earth for you with our analysis. Hence, if that then which a greater cannot be thought 
can be thought not to exist, then that in which a greater cannot be thought is not the same as that in which a greater cannot be thought, which is absurd. Something than which a greater cannot be thought exists so truly then that it cannot be even thought not to exist. Okay, and then he talks to God for a moment or presumes to do so. He says, and you, Lord God, are this being. You exist so truly, Lord God, that you cannot even be thought not to exist. And this is as it should be, because if some intelligence could think of something better than you, the creature would be above the creator and would judge the creator, and that is totally absurd. In fact, everything else there is, except you alone, can be thought of as not existing. You alone, then, of all things, most truly exist, and therefore of all things possess existence to the highest degree, because anything else does not exist as truly, and so possesses existence to a lesser degree. Why, then, did the fool say in his heart there is no God, when it is evident to any rational mind that you of all things exist to the highest degree? Why, indeed, unless because he was stupid and a fool? Now, I would not at all... Huh, um, side with the way uh, that he uses language there. I mean, he continues to refer to the atheist in the term of foolish uh, to deny that God exists when it's impossible to even think that. But um, as much as he may veer off the of rails a little bit there, um, there is still a lot more to say. There's more objections to this. So Stephen and others, if you find yourself a little critical of the argument, skeptical of the force of the argument, then you may enjoy the next few lectures where we go into the criticisms, you know, so nothing in philosophy stands unchallenged. There's going to be a whole host of responses and criticisms of this. So we're going to start learning about them next time. But uh, for now, anyways, we've run out of our class time. So appreciate everyone's attendance and attention this morning. I'll summarize and recap the main points that we had today on Friday at the beginning, and then we'll just go a stage further as we talk about um, the critical objections to this argument. And there are definitely uh, many of them, and it's quite interesting. We will not necessarily be going over everything in Aquinas' five proofs, but we will be discussing the cosmological argument, which, which St. Thomas Aquinas did, in fact, uh, believe in and, and, um, and argue for. So indirectly, we'll, we'll touch on some of the ideas of a person like Aquinas. So thanks again, everybody. I don't want to keep you any longer. Have a great day. Remember, we're going to be on YouTube Live on Friday at 10. Same thing, same place and time. Okay? Take care again, and I will definitely see you guys in a few days. Let me know by email if there's anything I can do to help. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. <clears throat>